I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I am here with Aaron. Wow. Right. Let, let's start over. What's your last name? My, well, my name on my birth certificate is Aaron Green Hicks, but my real last name is Rothschild. Very good. Okay, so <laughs> let's, you know, because that's going to be, and I'm going to ask you to speak as loudly as you can. Okay, I'm sorry. Because we don't have, uh, you know, th this is, uh, as I said, low tech, and, and, and really it's a choice of mine to, to sort of stay low tech here and um, try to get the word out using what means I have at my disposal under okay. the circumstances when I go to a conference and I'm in motion constantly and part of the time listening to the speakers, other part of the time running around trying to interview people, so, um, and without a crew. So, at this moment, just let's repeat this. So, your your first, your name is Aaron. Aaron Green Hicks. Okay. And my real last name would be Rothschild if I had stayed in the family. Okay. Yes. And I heard you speak, and it was, it was really stunning, and I have to, I want to give you credit here because it can't have been easy. Um, it wasn't easy at all. Okay, and I don't know if you've done much public speaking, but no, just on Friday was my first time ever. Okay, and you did a you handled yourself very well, oh, and you. and you were uh, very credible, and this is a, a you know has to be a very difficult um, situation, but it's a very important sort of revelation right, for you right. and, that's and for why the I'm people out there and thank you for having the courage to actually you know to do a Camelot interview I'm, I'm sure after you do this you're gonna get a lot of flack for having done so um, and so I'm just giving I'm you prepared. a heads up okay I'm prepared that's why I'm doing it now and I understand the ramifications of the entire situation okay yes. great uh, so at this moment can you sort of talk a little bit about when you say when it had you remain part of the family um, when I was born, uh, they put me um, into, they took my father and I and put us outside of the family. And um, my father uh, was uh, the, the head of the military shadow government, and he put me into MK Ultra. They took us out of the family so that I could be in these programs. Okay, and can you talk about your father and mother, their um, sort of, is it your father who is the Rothschild? Yes, yes. My father is a Rothschild. My mother was the Sinclair. Okay. Yes. Great. And you say he's head of he was head of the shadow government. Can the, you explain the military part of the shadow government? He had to deal with um, time travel. He dealt with MK all the black ops programs at the time from the 1940s until the 1970s. Okay. Uh, are are you able to say his name? R. C. Green, Senior. Okay. His everything's wiped on him. When he tried to, after he was um, remarried, um, after my mother passed away, he tried to get his birth certificate to go to Ireland, and there is no record of his birth. There's no record of my father anywhere. There's no medical records. There's no military records. There's no congressional records. There's no anything on my father. Fascinating. Yes. Uh, so. And I've never seen my birth certificate either. Never. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about your mother? I don't... My mother, all I know about my mother really... Well, my mother over here wasn't my real mother. My mother... See, that this is part of what I didn't speak about um, Friday. We walked over here from another dimension, my father and I. So the Rothschild bloodline that I am from is from the other dimension. I am not from the Rothschild bloodline from over here. Okay. Yes. And can you explain how you know that? Um, Project Ibis. Okay. And can you talk about that? That's very difficult. Um, uh, somebody had come up to me um, the other day and asked me a question I've been waiting to hear my entire life. And it was, do I remember my rescue? And uh, he meant my rescue from uh, Canada, from Ibis, when I was being stored. And... Um, when you're being what? Stored. Stored. Yes. They, they, we're stored until we're need, needed. When, when uh, they regress us, they, um, they, they keep us in fetal state until they need us again. Okay. 
Um, it's difficult to, to understand unless you've actually lived it. Sure, of right? course. I, um, I remember everything from before I came over here. I have full recollection of my life from before. Okay, so you came, would you say you came from a parallel dimension? Yes, parallel universe that is exactly like this one, only they were peaceful, they brought peace. So what happens is, uh, because I knew how to bring peace and I was part of IBIS, I was brought over here and taken, regressed, and then when I was put into um, MK Ultra, they had to break me down, all the peacefulness I knew and all of everything that I knew from over there. It still was inside of me, but it was pushed behind a block and I was broken down to be part of this place here so that I could um, do what I had to do, which was be part of these programs. Okay, uh, so Project, because uh, you know I've interviewed um, or, or, or gotten information from Michael Prince who is also known as James, right. James Casbolt and has talk, talked about mm -hmm. Project IBIS. Mm -hmm. So in what way are you part of Project or were you part of Project IBIS? There's a lot of it I can't talk about. Okay. And I'm not prepared to talk about uh, talk about it fully. It's it's painful for me um, because I've had so many regressions. It, I haven't had just one or two or three. It's a constant, ongoing thing. They take me and they put me from universe to universe to universe. And and once one becomes peaceful, I get regressed, and then I get put in another one. Then when that one becomes peaceful, I get regressed again and put in another one. And the time that I came over to this one, my entire family, my children, my and my husband came over with me. Now they're not part of Project Ibis, but they got brought over with me. Okay. And what's the sensation for them when you say being brought over with you? In other words, because I assume you know you've reached a certain age in this universe, mm -hmm. and uh, they also, but you wouldn't have met him until right. a certain point. Right. My father um, had access to time travel technology when he was um, in, in the military shadow government and he did this in the 1940s. He knew that I was going to be born, obviously. So he went forward to when he knew that I was going to meet my husband and found out who my husband was going to be um, because ultimately he knew he was going to have to be my handler as well. And um, he, uh, when he found out who my husband was going to be, he encoded me with my husband. And so it was always meant to be that I married him. Um, my it was encoded in my name. My name my name Aaron um, and then Sean in the middle. My middle first and middle name. Aaron means peace, and Sean is Gaelic for Johnny, and my husband's name is Johnny. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, so is your husband aware of any of this? Yes. Was he aware before you told him, or is this something that you revealed to him? I think he kind of knew. He was waiting for me to say it. My husband doesn't like to to uh, say too much about this stuff because it's still so new to him. His awakening it is new. He, he's, he knows what he's here for. He knows what he's got to do himself. He knows that he was also part of... Um, they would go to him for coordinates during Desert Storm on the... He was on the USS Saratoga, and they would pull him aside and ask him, okay, what's the next coordinate we should hit? Where should we uh, target next? And they would get things from him. And he didn't remember they were doing these things to him until I started waking up, and I started remembering. And my son is a catalyst, actually, for my awakening, and my awakening was the catalyst for my husband's awakening. And my daughter, who was 13, has always been awakened to it. Okay. But when you say awakened, being a Rothschild, being born into that, that sort of arena, mm -hmm. were you um, sort of, at what point did you become awakened? Was it after you had your son? It was about when my son was 15. So that would be about three and a half, four years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I was prior to that, what, where was your head at? What, what was your trajectory? All over the place. All over the place because um, I couldn't understand why I was promiscuous. I couldn't understand why I would get angry so mad, you know, so quickly. I, my anger just, just is is so it, it's awful. I can just go off the handle right away. It doesn't take much to trigger it, and it's not bipolarness or anything. I found out that it was uh, when I would get triggered from my um, programming. 
Okay. Um, you know, and, and let me say here, just because, you know, I ask pretty direct questions, and I know you haven't done this before, but um, I want you to feel free to tell me at any time that you don't feel comfortable answering the question. It, you're feeling a little yeah. bit. Yeah, and I, I don't. It's okay. I don't want to scare you. Oh, you're not I, I don't, scaring me at all. Okay, and I do, but I don't want to intimidate you. I don't want you to, you know, be caught unawares. I want you to know and feel comfortable with what we're doing here. I actually do feel here. very comfortable. Okay. So it's not that. I guess my nervousness is I know once I walk out the door from this interview, um, I'm in extreme danger. I'm already followed. I'm chased on the freeways in San Diego. Um, I have a brother who's a Rockefeller, and I will not say his name. Um, I refuse to say his name because he calls hits on, on me all the time. He had his wife um, put all of my information from my name to my phone number to my address and everything, how to get a hold of me on Twitter. And, and they were, uh, he had sent me money one time for my children to eat because I was, I was pushed aside to be poor and destitute for, for all of my programming. And he was left in the family to be rich and he's at the top. I can't say who's his father, but um, he, uh, so he sent me money one time, and it was $300. Actually, his wife sent it. And when it got to me in the States, it was $357. And the significance to that is he, he has Jesse James's um, 357 Magnum, and he had it in a picture, and that was a warning for me to shut up. And once I didn't shut up, you know, that was not only a warning from him, they, that was like a warning from the entire family, Rockefellers, Rothschilds. They were wanting me to keep my mouth shut. And uh, I didn't, so the, the hits started becoming once a month, once a week. And, and the day before we came here, they uh, sent a motorcyclist up next to us that was, uh, he looked in the car, looked at my husband in the eye, and then he swerved into us, didn't hit us, but got close enough to where it caught my husband off guard. And we hit a car in front of us, which hit another car. And he drove off knowing that he had caused an accident and nobody can find, you know. Sure, I understand. Yeah. So, but, okay, and so that was on the way here? Yes. Okay, wow, yeah. Um, all right, so on the stage, you, you talked um, very specifically about, I guess what you were talking about was how you were brought up and Dr. Mangala? Mangala? Mangala. Mangala. Yes. yes. So do you want to talk about that sure, a little? Sure, uh, sure. Um, I didn't know that up until just maybe April of last year that the man that I happily called grandpa was Dr. Mangala, Dr. Green. And that's why my name is, uh, my last name is Green. Um, in these programs, I'm sure you know that we're encoded with colors. And, and uh, um, I'm encoded with green because Dr. Green was uh, the one who was my, he gave me the love up until I was four. So my love bombing, the love part of my love bombing was him loving me. So I knew humanity from Mangala. I knew humanity in a way that nobody else saw from him. And to me, he was gentle, he was loving. He would, there was a white rocking chair that he would get in and he would sit me in his lap and he would just sit and he'd rock and rock and rock me. And I'd hear lullabies in German and English. He would tell me um, uh, fairy tales and stuff like that in German and English. He, he gave me a wonderful uh, and beautiful uh, memory of a grandparent because that's what I saw him as. I don't know if, I'm, if he's any kind of blood relation because I don't know if Mangala is you know, within any of these families. I haven't researched that. Um, I try not to research anybody's stories because when I give my story, I want my story to be my experience from my first-hand experience. So everything you do hear from me is only me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but so somehow, though, he was part of your family at that time. Right, right. When you were... Every day I would go to, up until I was four years old, I spent every single day that my father spent in the Pentagon. And I was allowed to do whatever I wanted. Dr. Hayward, I mean, excuse me, um, Admiral Hayward and Admiral Holloway, um, they were two SECNAVs, consecutive SECNAVs during the 1970s. And I used to sit on their lap while my dad would, he, my dad would bring me in, drop me off, and he would go and do his work in the shadow government that he had to do. And the Secretary of the Navies would 
sit me on their lap, pull out the coloring books and crayons, and I would sit and color and, and play in their laps while senators and, you know, all kinds of congressmen, high-level elite, would all come in and they'd discuss things and they're not thinking a four-year-old child has taken it in, you know. And here I am, I'm brought here to be an observer. I'm brought here to, to, to know what's going on. So my little uh, mind was taking it all in. Okay. And I've been in the uh, Situation Room. I've I happily always walked into the White House before um, we would even walk up to it. The door would open, and they say, Hi, "Hello, Mr. Green," and I'd just come trotting in behind them, and I could just go and do what I wanted. Okay, so in a sense, he was. Uh, I mean, did you see him also interact with your parents at that time when you were like young? No. Whenever no? I was with him, it was alone. Okay, um, so in a sense, perhaps he was your handler. He could have young been. Age. He very much could have been. Like mm -hmm. I said, he was a love part of my program. Yeah. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so did you grow up in like a normal house? Oh, no. It was so extremely strict. And I, I grew up with money. So I wasn't without money. It just wasn't as much money as my brother was able to grow up with. And I, I the, my parent, but my there was a lot of abuse in my house, but there was also a lot of BTs in my house um, at times. And uh, so I grew up having these meetings with ETs and stuff with my parents at a very young age. Okay, so, but um, just just to kind of paint a picture for people. Okay. Can we describe, like, the house that you grew up? Where was it? What state? Um, oh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., my first nine years and then my second nine years after that's when my father um, retired from the shadow government and he um, moved us down to southern Maryland and uh, we just I I had a normal house and the only thing that was that we tried to portray a perfect family on the outside and when I would go behind closed doors my father would um, I always knew when it was coming because he would come in, he'd strip me from waist down, hold me by two feet, and I could hear the belt come off, and he would beat me until his frustration was done. And that was part of my programming was to be beat like that. My mother, um, at least once a month, would poison me with something. And I can remember her standing over me, and I'm on the ground, and I'm writhing in pain because this is eating my stomach alive. And, and she just looks at me and she goes, you know, suck it up, get up, it's time to get up you know and she didn't care she wanted me gone because I was put with her and I wasn't her child and uh, when you say you weren't her child whose child were you the mother on the other side oh okay and do you remember the uh, mother on the other side loving as can be beautiful loving wonderful woman okay so what what time in other words when you say because it sounds like you were going back and forth from side to side then because if you knew your mother as a loving person, then you had to be I have old enough to remember. I have full recollection of before I was regressed from where I was before. Okay, so when you say regressed, I, I think maybe it's the usage of that word. But let's say, um, let's say you lived a life on the other side, mm -hmm. okay? And you reached, uh, let's even just start with the age of four. Okay. If you're at the age of four on the other side, do you grow to the age of your age now? Yes. Okay. And if when you say you're regressed, you, if you cross over to this side, then what happens to the to the person who is now, let's say, I'm, I, I'm what is your age approximately? I will be 44 in two weeks. It's funny. I was just going to say 44 if your age is 44. I don't know where that was coming from. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you're 44. You go into this program in Canada. You you walk into a facility as a 44-year-old woman, then you're regressed, you right, say. Right. Regressed how? Do you know? No. I just know it was painful. I remember my husband, He before we came over here, my husband looked at me. He walked over to me, and I'm sitting on a couch like this. And he just holds out his hand, and he goes, are you ready? And I said, yes. And he goes, you know this is going to hurt a lot. And uh, I said, I know. And there I came. I walked over with my father, and then my, the, the, I don't believe my husband's body or my children's bodies were brought over, but I do know that their souls were brought here and put in different, you know, the bodies they needed to be in for our family to be together again. Okay. There's a mission with my family, and my family is brought here to do peace. 
You okay. know, it's just getting there. It's getting all of us uh, uh, super soldiers together and mind control victims and, and even the Project IBIS um, children together, all of us, so that we can uh, change what's happened and use what's happened to us against who harmed us. Okay, so, but are you, you are a Rothschild on the other side as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. So at this point, at some, in some way you're regressed that you don't remember, but do you start out as a baby on this side? Yes. Okay, so you have to go through all those ages again, right? Right. right. Okay. So, but you have the memory, the recall. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm it, anxious to do regression sometime. I would love to do it so that I can. That that's. It, it, I feel that would be my way of proving it to everybody. If I can have a, a videotaped regression done, so that uh, people can see that I'm telling the truth. I have nothing to hide. Okay, let me ask you. Have you ever seen the TV show Fringe? Yes, I identify with that absolutely, 100 percent. Okay, my question to you is: If you look at, um, I forget her name. It's it's not Olivia. Yeah, Olivia. It, when she goes back over to the other side, there's another Olivia there, okay? Right. So she doesn't go through kind of the way you're describing it. In other words, she's already on this side, grew up on this side, so-and-so. But the Olivia she meets grew up in a different parallel reality. Right. And I believe that we do have multiple realities going on simultaneously. Yes, yes, And absolutely. we're all actually on both sides. But right. I've actually recently had some whistleblowers who are time travelers mm -hmm. who have revealed to me what and I, I, I it's been a leap of, of conjecture for me basically saying what seems to be happening because they have identified that there are some people here who appear to be um, scientists for example Nazi scientists from uh, from the time of paperclip who are here even in as younger men in, but the same men, in other words, uh, very famous scientists, um, Werner von Braun, for example, um, and uh, what's this uh, 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 guy, uh, Max, is it Ingalls? I'm not sure. Anyhow, I, I, other people, and, and Mark Twain, for example, other people that aren't in black projects as we think of them. But basically what I understand is a possibility is the scenario that went on in uh, in Fringe, in which they actually crossed over and came over here. Mm -hmm. That body from that reality was brought over here, whereas the one that was here was di died or, or, or done away with in some way. Right. Right. So that's one scenario. Right. Now there's another scenario that sounds like, and, and then also the, there's a, a component part of that that wasn't in Fringe, but that they've actually learned how to do what you're just saying, which is regress. They've actually learned how to turn back the clock, so you not only don't age, but you actually can get younger. Right. And I don't think, now I, this may be the limits of my imagination, but I'm saying I, I don't think, in other words, I think it goes back to a certain, like I could be, at this point I could go back to maybe 19. I probably can't go back to being a baby, an infant in a crib type of thing. Mm -hmm. So at that point you have a gap. I know this is a long question, and I'm no, kind of—I don't, I'm following. I don't I'm mean following. to go into like a big lex explanation here, but I'm really curious what you would might think of this. Is it possible that you might have some mis missing time between the age of zero and ten? I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. picking a number out of a hat, in which you actually don't have memories from this side. That is an absolute possibility. It is. It's an absolute possibility. Okay. I don't, I don't uh, push anything away these days. You know, I, I, if somebody brings it to me, obviously there's a reason. So okay. maybe I should look into that and regression would be the way to do it. Right. Okay. So, but, it, but it's not something that you are, are, like at this moment, if I said, do you remember everything? I mean, nobody remembers everything, I don't think, from when there were, you know, like whatever age a person is to there's a right. zero, in, even on this side. Right. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times there'll be gaps in your memory. Oh, anybody can have that happen. Yeah. Yeah. But so. but do you have you ever noticed like a profound sense of any gaps in my twenties? Gaps in, in 20s. your twenties. Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Like whole maybe years or, or or spans of time where you don't recall having been here, kind of like. Yes. Years. Because you don't have pieces to put in there. Yes. Years. 
years. Okay. All right. It's just interesting. It's it's just gathering data. We don't, you know, I don't know where it leads. I yeah. was just because I've been I've been putting it's this just, puzzle it's together. It's little puzzle pieces. Once we get all these puzzle pieces together, we'll find peace. Yeah. We just got to get all these puzzle pieces together. Right. And and I think that it's a fascinating it's a fascinating story in in general uh, with humanity and when you bring time travel into it it's a new component that most people haven't really thought of I don't know if you know but I've just done a conference on time travel no I haven't looked at it yet <laughs> yeah no 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 problem but uh, it, it's quite fascinating and I, I have whistleblowers that are talking about time travel etc and you so know Mars yet? yes I know a bit about Mars too. yeah and that would be great to hear um, your take on all of that so but be you know, so that we don't jump too far ahead. Absolutely. I want to stay in kind of this area, and I'm sorry if we, no, if you're even fine this here. seems a little confusing to people listening. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm conscious that I want to keep a through line. So at this point, you, you were regressed. You come back. You have these memories, uh, and you're over on this side. Mm -hmm. But you are a Rothschild. You're growing mm -hmm. up, and you're being tortured mm -hmm. in Maryland, mm -hmm. and you're also. I was also tortured in the Kentucky facility underground. That was my main torture point. Okay, but yeah. but at what ages? Because you started off, you said I men, can you were I remember a valid memory about 12 years old, 10 to 12 years old maybe. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, Well, you, when you, okay, the years when you were in the Pentagon mm -hmm. as a child, mm -hmm. after that, if you were just in, to try and make a through line, at what point do you get into the Kentucky facility? Where does that fit well, in? Well, after I started getting raped at four, because once I start, once I turned four years old, that's when my um, my the t the painful torture started, the the bad part of the love love bombing, and um, uh, the minute I turned four years old, my father walked me into a room, and uh, a bunch of men that were high up in the Pentagon, um, I can't say who it was, uh, they all raped me, and. Um, then my father took me home. My mother didn't care, didn't wipe me up, didn't clean me up, didn't take me to the doctors, didn't do anything, just sat me in my room and that was it. Okay, now, but did you have a conscious memory of this or you had to be regressed to find this out? I had a conscious memory of it. At, at, from what age? About four years ago. Really? Yeah. So it just came through at, mm -hmm. at some point? My, my, uh, my son is the one that started breaking down first and that's what started my just my memories just what do you mean your son started my breaking son's a down super soldier okay how old is your son he is 18 now okay and when you say he started to break down what do you mean by that at the age of 12 I didn't know he started smoking marijuana and marijuana is a deprogrammer and by the age of 15 he broke down in front of me and my husband and said I don't know what's going on with me mom but they keep telling me from the age of two on that my name is Jesus Christ and uh, through research and finding out, um, I found out it's called Chosen One Messiah Training. Yeah, and it, I'll show you pictures. Um, on his back, all the way down his back, they took a whip to him, and they take these whips to these children um, to um, simulate what happened to Jesus. And, and uh, they, they break him down, but they tell him, you're Jesus Christ, you're Jesus Christ, you've got to get whipped, you know? And I, I mean, I don't know exactly what he went through because I didn't have that particular training. Right. Um, but it broke him down something awful. I mean, it took years for, for me to get him to understand he's not Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know? And this was a particular programming done to him, and there's a few people in the world like him, so he's not the only one. Well, I can actually tell you because... Uh, you, you probably don't know that much about Camelot, but um, in my work, mm -hmm. I have people write to me all the time this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there are many people out there being programmed, what I call them Manchurian candidates, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a Collins that I used to talk to um, quite a bit, and uh, she told me she was afraid for my son because she thought, because there for a while he had such rage because of his anger over what happened to him. You, um, and I won't say this on camera, um, yeah, I'll, his name, I should say, but you interviewed the man that um, was my son's handler, his abductor, and his torturer. Interesting. From age two on, I'll tell you after the camera's off. Okay, yeah, I, I, I actually have a clue, but I'm not going to say anything here. Um, okay, well, okay, just to go back to you, so you were in a Kentucky fence facility where? I have, you know, now that I think about it, um, um, 
from like age four to age ten, I don't really have much recollection of anything. Okay. All right, that's fine. And then at ten, I mean, wh what I'm trying to get at here is you brought up the Kentucky facility, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm willing to go there. But can you say what age you were at when 10, you were 12 years old? That's 10 to when 12. they pick the memories okay. pick back up. Okay, so you're you're at the Kentucky facility. Are you living somewhere at the same time? Maryland. So you're in, going in DC, back and Maryland. forth. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, now you you said you had ETs that you were in um, meetings with ETs with your parents. When was that happening? You know, if I if I could give an age, I would, but I don't remember the exact age. No, but it doesn't have to be exact. Like okay. a span um, you, um, in your teens, it has, later. Oh no, I was still earlier. little. Um, this might have been when I was uh, somewhere between three, four years old, maybe even five. I'm I'm not sure. Maybe my. Huh, it's so confusing. It's, sure. I'm still trying to sort through all the files to figure this out myself. Right, but would you say, because I have questions, in other words, I'm not so concerned other than because it's helpful when a person's listening to the story to get a kind of chronology. Right, right, absolutely. But the chronology is not as important as the information which surrounds the incidents. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, I'm getting at here is that... I was bitsy. I was still bitsy. You were small? Yeah. Okay, and when you saw the ETs, what did they look like? There was many different races. There was a human one. Um, there was a couple grays in there, tall, short. Mm -hmm. um, ab absolutely, there were reptilians, but I'm I'm a 50 50 percent reptilian myself, actual hybrid. So um, they were there, and my parents were sitting. They were on the couch, and I was so little. I used to go under the cushions and scare my family. When they would sit on me, I go rawr, you know, like a kid, you know, little kids do, and. And uh, but I didn't know what was getting ready to happen. But I put myself under these covers, and next thing I know, I have all these ETs sitting on me. And they, I personally believe they were consciously aware of me under them, obviously because of their telepathic abilities. And um, but they didn't let on. And my mother and father are sitting there with guns. I've never seen a gun in my house before that. And it is my belief they were wanting to take me, and my parents would not let them. And okay. my parents kept telling them, she's under contract, she can't be taken. Okay, but were they good ETs or bad ETs, would you I say? never got a bad feeling. I never got okay. a bad feeling. But your parents had guns. Mm -hmm. So, But your parents were torturing you, so those weren't necessarily the good guys, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but I just yeah. want to be clear here. Yeah. Um, so... So but, I could have been, I think that ultimately maybe they were trying to take me away from all the pain mm -hmm. because never once have I ever been hurt by any extraterrestrial, no alien being. It has always, always, always been an earth human that has tortured me. Okay. Um, well, I have a lot of different places we can go, but before I go there, uh, when did this memory come back to you? I've always had that memory. That never that went never away? That never went away from me. Okay. This is so something you, I told my husband back in 1987 when I met him. Okay. Yeah. So you were cognizant of ETs and that, that whole side of, of life, so to speak. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me ask you this. As, you know, as a member of, the, of an Illuminati family, mm -hmm. you grow up, they're doing these things to you, but the things aren't just done because they're bad people per se. Right. They actually have a purpose in mind. It's a yeah. twisted purpose. But it actually has an objective. I know. Are you and I aware know of you this? Yeah, I'm extremely aware of it, and that's why I've forgiven them. Okay. I'm okay. You know, I know what happened ultimately had to bring me to a good part, but I had to be broken down in a way that was uh, very binding to this 3D world. I had to be bound to this world, but I had to be bound to it through the pain that Gaia was feeling also, you know. Okay. Um, did they ever sit you down and communicate it to you in, you know, X, Y, Z? Did they talk about it? No. So where did you learn? Soul cell memory. From the, okay, f through meditation? Yes. Okay. Yes. And when did you start to meditate? Uh, about a year and a half ago. That's yeah. all? Yeah. Okay, but you're... I took, I took a year time away from even... Uh, being consciously 
a mother and a wife. I took myself and I sat in my bedroom and um, I would lock my door at times and I would sit there with the TV off. I would have no computer with me and I would just meditate on my own DNA. And uh, my DNA, I knew that my DNA would tell me everything. And uh, uh, it has. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I, what, what I, have, I do have to interject that um, my brother, who's the Rockefeller, told me that I, I tried to talk to him before about everything because I knew my mom wasn't my mom. I, I knew that things were askew. I knew that all these ETs were coming into my home and, and everything I've told you. And I was trying to put my own puzzle pieces together and I'm like, you know, what's going on here? And he said, there's absolutely no way I'm telling you. He said, but in three years, you're going to come back to me. And in three years, you're going to ask me the question, am I right about everything about myself? And he said, at that moment is the moment I'm going to tell you that you're absolutely correct. And in three years, I went back to him. And, and it, I didn't remember the conversation with him about this until after I had asked him, am I right about everything? And he said the one word answer was yes. Okay. And then so, I remembered asking him, talking to him about it. Okay. Now, why do you call a Rockefeller a brother? We, we have the same um, ET DNA. Okay, so you believe you're related on the ET side. What about the Rock? Are, is there a marriage between the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds? They're all interbred. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I guess that's a dumb question in a sense. But what I meant is, uh, were you aware of of a specific, no. you know, bloodline relation? No, my brother was made in Area Fifty One. You probably know who my brother is, but I'm. Please don't say it on camera. He is vicious. Okay. And people call him a fraud, and he's not a fraud. I have witnessed what he can do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, that's an interesting uh, trajectory. Uh, let me let me ask you, if if you say your brother was made in Area Fifty One, you mean he was a test tube baby kind of thing? Yes. Okay. Um, does he know that? He's a fully conscious being here. He was groomed in the Rockefeller family to be at the top. And he's a very secret at the top person. Is he head of MJ-12? You don't have to answer that. And I'm not going to. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay. Let me ask you this. Growing up, going through this trajectory, you're saying your real sort of awakening, though, only happened like three years ago? Yeah, it's been between like three, it, maybe about the three to five year time span. I, I started having a little, little like, I would tell my husband, things are askew about my family. You know, I know it. I know what's, that there's something going on here. And then when my son had his breakdown, it was like a flood started happening in my family immediately. I, just everything came. And the, the, the SS that did the stuff to my son was the actual first person that we went to about everything. Really? And I did That wasn't even, exactly the best No, choice. but I didn't know that at the time. Okay. The afterwards is when I found out that he was the handler. Right. Right. Very you interesting. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I was led to him because I, I just it's all it can only be divine that you're led to something like that, you mm -hmm. know? It really is because that was just telling me that it was time to find out everything. Okay. Now, I, 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 what you told me is that you hadn't, when you went on stage, although it's the first time you did it kind of that way, that you said you had been talking about it. Mm -hmm. I, I did two really itty-bitty radio shows that it was more like talking to a group of people, you know, maybe 10, 12 people or so. Okay. And so it was like just having a, a get-together with family, you know, or friends or something. Uh -huh. But I did a radio show in um, January called The Galactic Con Connection with Erica Getch, and um, that was my first real, like, coming out to everyone. Okay. Um, that had 300,000 live viewers, and I didn't know it until afterwards, and, and if I had known it during it, I probably would have stumbled all over everything because I'm just a nervous wreck telling all of this. Okay, um, well, we, we no one would know that. I mean, you, you have a, a wonderful sense of poise, oh, but I, I'm afraid it came from 
a very dark circumstance. It did. So, you know, uh, as much mm -hmm. as I can say that it, you know, uh, y you have maintained a great sense of poise within all of it. But um, I did a lot of work to get here. You know, I, a lot of work on myself in that year to be able to be I calm see. enough. Okay. And, and so did you plan to come forward? You know, a part of me always wanted to say something once I started learning it. But the more I got harassed and the more directed energy on me and the more my brother pulled the hits on me and, and stuff, I stepped back just ever so slightly once in a while. And when January came, I don't know, it just was like I knew it was time. It was just time. It, it's, uh, I know it's the beginning instead of what people thought was the end last year. I know this is the beginning. So if I don't begin to tell and begin to disclose everything I know, then I'm hiding a very vital part because my father ultimately was someone who was a very, very uh, dark creature in this world. And uh, I have a lot of guilt about what my father did because I'm here at the summit with people that um, some of them are as old as me or some of them were, were being programmed during the time my father was in there. So I feel guilt that my father has done this to these people. And, and I feel like if I don't come out, then I don't release them either. You know? Okay, uh, but I understand who you say your father was, uh, more or less, but we're also talking about the entire Rothschild family, yeah. right? Yeah. So in, in terms of, you know, the, the lineage of this group of people, right, you understand that the reptilian influence uh, on 100%. them. 100%. Okay. And yet you fully acknowledge that you're half reptilian, right? Absolutely. And when we talked off camera a bit, y you and I both discussed the fact that not all reptilians are bad. That has been my mantra from the beginning because I have never had a bad experience with them. Um, I've, I've not been uh, subjected to my family, the Rothschild family, from, you know, since I was little or on the other side or whatever. But I, so I don't have the darkness of that to compare it to because every reptilian I came across was always kind to me and gentle with me. In the Pentagon they would sit me in a chair and I would sit there just like a little, you know, a little kid does, swinging my feet back and forth just looking and these, there would be a row of them in front of me and they would, you know, and just like that and just stare at me and just look at me. And, and it was the oddest thing but I, they did it so much that I became comfortable with it. And uh, one time when I was in the Kentucky facility, one tried to get me um, away from the human so that I wouldn't be tortured anymore. He said I had enough. He kept telling them, she's had enough, she's had enough, let her go, release her. And they said no, another, another person that said she's under contract, she cannot be released. This contract is a lifetime contract. And so he, he looked at me and I've never in my life seen a reptilian cry and this reptilian shed tears. And he said to me that uh, uh, I can't do anything more for you. They won't stop. So what I'm going to do for you right now is a gift. And, and that's when my lights went blank. That's when everything went dark for me and I stopped remembering because he, he put the block in so whatever they did to me, I wouldn't co you know, consciously remember it. Okay. Um, along those lines, do you remember interactions with the Catholic Church? Yes, I've seen, I've seen ritual sacrifices of children in the Vatican in the bowels of it. It's vile. It's the most vile place on earth. It's the most evilest, darkest. It is the it it is evil personified. There is not there. God is not there. God left the building. God never entered that building and never will. Okay. He wants that building gone. He wants all of the popes gone. He's done with those popes. Those that that whole scenario there is is nothing but a sacrificial, uh, 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 ritualistic evil. I I can't even say enough about that place. It's awful. It's the worst place in the world. Okay, but mm -hmm. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, are you familiar with the black pope? Yes. Okay. Did you meet him? Consciously, I don't remember that. Okay. If I did. Okay. I'm sure. I mean, with everything that I've been through, I'm sure I have on yeah. more than one occasion. I, I think it's logical to, to assume that, but I'm not going to, you know, put words in your mouth over right, here. Right, right. Um, so with that in mind, though, 
we're talking about reptilians and because there's so much misunderstanding about reptilians out there I just want to make sure that it's clear so you believe that that at least the reptilians you dealt with and the half of reptilian that you are you believe that's a positive in other words we say service to others being absolutely okay but you would acknowledge that the reptilians that you saw sacrifice humans etc are not service to self would you not they are service to self I mean service to others yeah yeah they're, they're service not. to self beings correct right correct. okay so with that in mind um, and it's just a small minority of them it's like on earth you have the humans that most humans are really good humans you know they just want peace and they just want to live they mm -hmm. want to do what God let you know put them here to do and that's just advance their souls mm -hmm. um, but then you've got that little faction of people that just fight against everything and it's not the good fight not the fight that I'm in you know, it's the, it's the fight to continue to hold us in this third, third, di third dimensional dense, density that we're in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's just a small minority. You have a lot more good ETs than you have bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as what's going on, though, on here on Earth, mm -hmm. you, you do see the controllers moving in to take control of society yes. and um, sort of tightening the reins on society. You Absolutely. see the movement of the New World Order. Absolutely, and the Fourth Reich. Yes. yes. And, and, and the head of that would be the reptilians, yes. right? The, the Obama service serves them well. To sell. Okay. And are you also aware of what is called the Anunnaki? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And in is it your understanding that the Anunnaki and the reptilians are not the same beings? Or do you think that they're the same? Anunnaki is a very, it's a, it, it encompasses many races. Okay, right. But if I was to say Anunnaki in the sense that, that Sitchin talked about, in other words, uh, Enki, Enlil, and Anu, if I was to say those three names, and I was to say that as Anunnaki, those are at the at least how they're depicted on the Egyptian temples is as humanoid uh, feet, you know looking in other words they they, they can uh, be nine feet tall they weren't human okay and and so th do you believe that they were reptilian yes okay absolutely what about the notion that they might be half and half it's a possibility okay have you heard of S Syrian reptilians No. Syrian Anunnaki you haven't heard of that? Yeah. Okay. Um, because my understanding is that there is more than one race uh, of that particular group from Nibiru, mm -hmm. and that some of them well, appear to be Well, that would make sense. Syrian. Total sense. you got Earth that has many different races. Yes. So why not, why not Nibiru? Exactly. Um, but, but it is an interesting sort of line of, of, of investigation, let's say, because what I find is that people have different perceptions and different understanding about who the Anunnaki are when I and I when this race of Anunnaki are the ones that are descended from Enki and Lil and so this is a certain race and they have they appear to be from what I can tell half reptilian and half what appears to be a humanoid like species mm -hmm. rather than pure reptilian right right okay which is we in a sense and this is me throwing this out mm -hmm. are we have a, a smaller portion of reptilian than they do. So exactly, right. we're not half and half, although you say you are. Mm -hmm. um, we're more, uh, or the most, some of the humans here are a portion reptilian, but then more other races. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, what I, we're, my we're, investigations, we're what I call a hodgepodge. Yes. You know? Well, I was, I would say there's, there's a base, a base, twelve, mm -hmm. various species of, of, of. ETs that p went into what makes humans, well, what we call this that's why you got human. The 12. There you go. So you're aware of, of this sort of thing, this Absolutely. line of inquiry. Okay. I just don't talk about it a lot. Okay. But you <laughs> see that it's it's okay to talk about it. In, yes. in, in at least, now I do. I yeah. just have it in the past. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. I am very interested in people starting to understand our ET heritage. So oh, to speak. absolutely, I am too. That's that's the main thing for me. I I have taught all of my children so that they're absolutely uh, aware of where they're from, who they are, and and the fact that don't don't think it's a curse to be uh, a, a half reptilian. They 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 look at it as a gift now. 
you know, my son for a while uh, cursed it, you know, mm -hmm. but now he sees that he was given a gift. You know, you got to look, a lot of super soldiers don't look at what they get as a gift, you know, and a lot of the bloodliners don't look at, at, at what they get as a gift, and really, it is a gift. We're here for a purpose, and, and our blood serves that purpose. Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, we have a limited amount of time here, and, uh, you know, this is a great, great opportunity and a great chance to talk to you and, and, and go down these roads. Maybe we can do this again in the future, even Absolutely. long distance. Um, if you're in San Diego, actually, you're not that far from me. I can always drive up. Okay, and <laughs> so because I happen to be just north of, of L.A. Okay. Um, but at this moment, um, just in the interest of time, you went through this torture. You witnessed torture. Um, at a certain point, you must have been, um, like, before your awakening, so to speak. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with it before your awakening? I was very promiscuous. Okay. So you were exercising... Okay. Searching for love any way I could get. And I was married at this time, you know. I've mm -hmm. been married since 1989. So my husband has had to put up with a lot. But he, he uh, something inside of him told, told him that he just needed to stick with me through it because there was a bigger picture that was going to be figured out later. And obviously there was. Um, but I became extremely promiscuous, and that's my monarch programming, you know, that was coming out of me. I would always be promiscuous with military men. It was always a military man. Okay. When you say you had monarch programming, did you go on any kind of missions in, that, in those roles? Yes. I and can remember taking one man to his death. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, you knew you were being used or programmed, even though you weren't awakened the way sort of we're talking about it. Oh, there was always something off in my mind. I knew there was something that I needed to figure out about myself because I couldn't pinpoint why was I doing these behaviors? Why was I acting out? Why would I get so upset? Why would I uh, uh, go sleep with all these men? I have a beautiful, wonderful husband, and, and I would go off searching for love, and I had unconditional love at home. You know, I had what I didn't have with my parents. I had the love and, that was absolutely unconditional from my husband. Okay, but aside from being a, a wife, you were programmed as a monarch's sort of slave, right? Right, right. And perhaps being sent on missions during those years as well, right? Mm -hmm. Even astrally, astrally speaking. Uh, a lot of my work was done astrally. Okay. At the same time, you were aware that you were a Rothschild. Is that correct? I didn't. Well, I wasn't aware that I was a Rothschild until um, about four years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. What did you think you were? I didn't know what I was. So you knew you grew up in Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. You knew that you were in the Pentagon as a child? Oh, that, that was an aware uh, uh, memory that I've always so, had. Okay, so you were Pentagon. aware of that. Mm -hmm. So you knew you came from, like, the military-industrial complex, yes, so to speak. Yes, I even remembered the rapes that were done to me at four years old, but I didn't know why they happened to me. I thought it was just something that happened to me. I didn't realize it was part of the programming. That was my very initial breakdown. That was the, the, the time when they took me from one to two. You, you understand what I mean, from right. personality to two. And then they were able to start working on me. They took me away from the man that loved me so much, and that was Mangala. And, and that broke me in and of itself. And that breaking plus the rapes did it. I split then. Okay. Right now I'm talking to Aaron. Right, absolutely. Is there multiple? I, I like to think I've integrated, but who knows, you know? Okay. Does that make sense? Um, well, yeah. They tried to wipe my brain. Now, the, before I came to this, this summit, they did try to wipe my mind. And they put, um, I, I was almost completely wiped. And uh, my children, my husband had to help me through it. I had to read uh, letters and uh, messages, texts, um, look at my Facebook. I had to start relearning myself again. So I, I, uh, I've had to learn my memories twice. But they put uh, an altar in me that was uh, named Sarah Sinclair. And uh, that's why I go by Sarah Sinclair on my Facebook, because I was identifying with that when they were wiping my mind. And right before I came here, they me lapped me every night for like two weeks straight. They were trying to tell me my husband doesn't love me anymore, your family doesn't love you, you know, nobody loves you anymore, and breaking me down so that I didn't come here. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you made it. I am too. It's the most amazing, amazing time in my life because I finally found, found what I considered my family. Okay. You know, there's an interesting thing going on with you that I want to throw out there. I'm an sure. intuitive and I see things sometimes and I just want to throw this out and see where, where you go with it. Okay. Um, when I on, saw you on stage, mm -hmm. you look like a much older woman. When I see you here, you look much younger. Mm -hmm. In other words, you seem to kind of be morphing and you seem to actually, in a sense, you, like you seem to be more in your 20s mm -hmm. where you are kind of like in your mental environment. Mm -hmm. Like as you're talking to me, you seem like a person in their 20s who's just discovering themselves. Oh. That's how you seem. I've had people tell me that before, actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You're not the first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, it's, it's just an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. So you, you, can you kind of feel that? I feel it when I start talking, I can feel my vibration just spin so fast. Uh-huh, but you, yeah. I, mean, I mean, are you having a sense of, time traveling might be too strong of a term, but in this sense, when I'm talking to you right now, it's almost as if the years between, you say you're 44 and that came into my head, so I assume that's correct. Mm -hmm. Between 44 and say 20, do you feel that there was something that went in during that, that time span that somehow in order to leap back to have this conversation we're having having in a sense you almost have to go back to being 20 again yes makes absolute it sense. does makes okay it just sense. seems like a weird dynamic happening you just here. put a puzzle piece in for me thank you Carrie okay yeah I'm yeah. trying to put it together myself yeah. as I'm looking at you okay yeah. because it's it's just very it's it's quite jarring I don't know yeah. what'll show up on the film yeah. I just know what I'm seeing mm -hmm. you know so it's very interesting you know, um, okay. Just in terms of the big picture, and I don't even know how. How do you feel about the big picture here on Earth? Do you think you know the scenario well, I or do you think you're happen. learning it? I'm not allowed to tell. I'm not asking you anything about it. I'm asking mm -hmm. you, do you think, like, if I just say, do you think you know the scenario as it's being rolled out here on Earth? Do you oh, think yes, you know? Oh yes, it's deja vu. It's complete okay. deja vu to me. Every time it happens to me, it's deja vu. I know what's I know what's going to come. I know what's going to happen. You do. Um, I I can't say because uh, what I know is going to happen. Humanity is not ready to hear about. Mm -hmm. So so it's it's going to take time. When I think humanity is ready to hear it, I'll speak it. Okay. But that also gets me killed too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know. So that's why I appreciate that. I just was curious whether you, and and this information. Did, does it come from the ETs, do you think, or did it come from your family? Because obviously the Rothschilds have an agenda, the Rockefellers. They are part of this future of humanity. They have an agenda they want to see happen. They're working Absolutely. very hard to have that happen. It may not happen, mm -hmm. okay, the way right. they want it to happen. Right, Okay, right. And that's key. But, but do, are you aware, of, for example, of something called Project Looking Glass? I've heard of it, but I've never looked into it, so okay. I don't really know it. That's okay. Yeah. Um, what about the yellow book? Yellow book? No. I don't yellow know. cube? No. Nothing about that? No. See, okay. I, like I said, I don't look into things because I try to stay true. That's all fine. You mm -hmm. know, some in some instances... No, Paperclip directly, Project Paperclip directly affected me because it was the Nazis brought over here. Right. Yeah. And why do you say that? Um, because they brought Mangala to me. Okay. They brought that. The Nazi influence is heavy in my family, from okay. from my father and mother. All right. And yeah. and do you feel? Uh, did you meet a lot of the paperclip scientists? A few. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I talked I've about, I've never admitted that before. Only Mangla have I admitted to before. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, when I. A, a little earlier, I talked about a time traveler um, who had been talking about these uh, scientists who have been seen, have been working, and they're actually what they do. This is what I was told. What they do is they actually are here. They've been regressed to much younger ages. They're they're in their like late twenties, sometimes their thirties. They're working very heavily on projects, mm -hmm. but they actually have jobs that make them look like they're surface, what I would call surface people. They they may have some low-level job in a in a in a in a in a clothing store or a 
or a, a, a well, an office supply story store. My yeah. father's uh, cover job was a congressional aide. So okay. He was only supposed to be known as a congressional aide. That's it. Right. And he headed everything. Yeah. You know? So uh, irony at, at its finest right there. Yeah. And, and so there seems to be some, like, even that's a time travel technique. In other words, to have the one sort of, and maybe, and this is another part of the story, which I was trying to piece together, which was maybe they have clones that are being used to go to work that day and appear to be like a normal human while they go into the underground base and take care of certain business. You're very intuitive. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, no, yes, this right. time That's traveler person right. came to me, mm -hmm. revealed these elements, and, you know, there was no other way to explain mm -hmm. what he was talking about but then to say that, in other words, to jump to that place. Right. Right. Um, they have several containers. Yeah. It's just not one or two. There's several. See, the government knows how to take your soul and just put it in this one, or put it in this one, right. or put it in this one. You know, people don't understand that it's a very easy process, actually. You know, we could do it ourselves. We can pull our own souls out and put it in another container. It takes well, a lot for a human to do it, though. You know, for, for like you or me or, or, or someone else to do it without tech, I should say. It takes tech to do it. Um, uh, for us to do it ourselves, it would take a high vibration from us to get it to get our souls to pop out to do it in in a conscious manner. Okay, yeah, and, and that gets into all kinds of ethics, but it, you're also there is also a darker side to that that would be called possession. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of, let's just say, in terms of the occult, were you taught this information when you were growing up? I was always taken to church. My parents made a point of always going to church because that was a cover. Now, if any, uh, I don't remember any uh, satanic anything. Else, you you know, don't like, remember being taught the occult? No, no, no. Okay. But I feel it heavily in my life. Alistair Crowley um, is very heavily um, ingrained in me. And uh, he tries to charm me all the time. He sends me hearts when he, wa he needs more uh, when he needs more uh, people on his side. He wants me to be over there because he knows my vibration level and he's trying to get me back. You know, he's trying to get me back with him. Okay, and so you're talking about him as if he's still alive. He is. He's a time traveler too. He okay. had, he had um, access to time travel tech. So he, he's here as if he was still a young man, you know, middle-aged man or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get, get everything back, you know. He wants it all back for himself. So, so well, what that tells me, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure that that makes sense. And I'll tell you why. And, okay. and you can tell me why it mm -hmm. does. Okay? okay, so I'm throwing out that because I have studied the occult, and okay. I do know a fair amount about Crowley, and I, won't, mm -hmm. I don't know everything about him by any, any means. But what I would say is that, and this is, is actually something I puzzled over, and I feel this way about, for example, Enki and Enlil and, and mm -hmm. so on. In other words, there seems, there must be a way that these individuals progress. They can't have all this knowledge and not progress. So it seems strange to me when you say he wants it all for himself. It doesn't seem logical, based on what I know about Crowley, that that would be true of him now. Well, he's still under, under contract to bring darkness. Until his, uh, until we become peaceful, his contract can't end. So oh, he's and that's got how you. Okay, who told you that? I can't say. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, there's a lot. Of that, that kind of thing could just. I could walk out the door right now, and, and I'm done. I hear you. Yeah. Um, he for us. Those of us that are part of Project Ibis, we're encoded with Crowley. Crowley's encoded in, in our DNA. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can you read the tarot? The tarot? Mm -hmm. Yes. I do that quite a bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you use the Crowley tarot? Um, I don't know what the Crowley tarot, tarot is, so I you wouldn't don't? know. Well, do you know which car deck you're using? Um, oh, my goodness. I feel so stupid right now because I don't remember the name of it. I have two separate decks at home. I have an angel deck, and then I have a deck that's um, uh, 
copied off of the the first tarot's, you know, the the original tarot's that were made. Okay, um, so you must have the old style deck, which I I don't know know the name of that. Um, all right. Fair it has enough. a tower where you see the Pope coming out and the Queen coming out. You know what I'm saying? That card. Yeah, I, I forget what it's called, but I understand it's the old style deck. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but there is a Crowley Tarot. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And it might be interesting for you in this awakened state mm -hmm. to look at those cards. Yeah. That's um, because what I was just thinking. his I partner, go. sort of wife, partner, and I forget mm -hmm. her name, I think it might have been Frida or something like that. Um, or maybe I have her name wrong. Anyway, at any rate, she painted them. Oh. And it's, it's, they're quite beautiful. Yeah. They're more beautiful well, than the know, original deck. Crowley made the Lima. The Lima is a beautiful religion. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's very spiritual. So people have to understand he's not all darkness. <laughs> you know, he's really not all darkness, mm -hmm. not in my eyes. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I'm encoded with him. Right. So, so to me, he's not anything more than just an experience. You know, he's just another part of my puzzle piece. You know, I don't really feel so much darkness. I, I get the, I, I think to myself, why in the heck am I getting hearts from him, you know? But that, that kind of throws me off a little bit, and I just tell him, I'm sorry, but my hearts go to my husband, you know? And that's how I put it to him, and he leaves me alone for a little bit, and then he tries again, and then I t get him to leave me alone. It's just an on and on and on process for him. Okay, are you in touch with members of the Rothschild family? No. Not at all? No. Okay. Have you ever been? Yes. Do you remember that? When I was a child, we used to go around them all the time. Because okay. um, as a child, I, um, I was very used to being around Kennedys, around Rothschilds, around Rockefellers, around all of the, those elite. My father always was uh, taking me around them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you traveled the world at all? Um, not consciously that I remember. I don't have a passport. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I never knew whether I could get one or not. I'm sure I'm on a no-fly list with my mouth that flies. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it would be, though, you know, everyone's, uh, basically your, your, your travels are also for self-awareness. So mm -hmm. the more you... If you were to travel, I would encourage you to do so, first of all, because it will awaken more memories. I would love to. If as I a can, soul. Yeah, yeah. I would love to. Yeah. Um, okay, well, at this point, I'm going to shut this down. And I, I actually, I'm supposed to go speak for a bit, a short bit, and I don't even know when. But oh, um, there's some other people coming along to hear. And, and, okay. But thank you so much for this. You're welcome. Absolutely. It's been a great conversation. Yes, and I very um, much enjoyed it. Very much. Okay, thank you. And I, I wish you well, and I hope that, that uh, you can come forward again and that we can talk some more. Yeah, and I'm going to come forward till it's all out, until everything's peaceful. I won't stop until peace happens. That's why I'm here. Aaron means peace. I'm here for peace. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, Aaron. You're welcome. <laughs>